2019, The Ethics of Reparation and Reconciliation. Now, I'm helping you too much. You have to do it on your own, ready? One, two, three. Four hundred years. Well, no, no, I want to punch. Four hundred years. Ready? One, two, three. Four hundred years. We're going to work on it because we have one more day to get it right. How is everyone doing? Great. You slept well? Yeah. Very, very, very good. We're excited today for just another amazing, Dr. 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 Warren said it keeps getting better and better and better and better. So we don't mind messing with the Queen's English. We have our own. <laughs> we have all the bodies. So we're getting better and better. Now you would think that I chose moderators based upon GPA, but trust me, I didn't. I simply went, I randomized those who are being efficient and work hard. It just so happened, that happened that they are 4.0. And you know how I feel about these 4.0 people. Jealous. <laughs> but uh, wait, I was in my, uh, my buddy Martin Espinosa, I, I preached from a few weeks ago, and in his office he had this wonderful degree, we both graduated from American Baptist College, and his, his degree and my degree look identical, except his says, summa cum laude. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife's degree from Florida Memorial says, magna cum laude. Oh. And my degree doesn't have anything, but it means thank you, laude. <laughs> So appreciate the not just the difference of a student, but one thing you notice for everyone who has come across again, they're randomized, but they have such humility. The fact that they're such they're so brilliant means very little to them. They're just marching forward. And this young lady said me head, uh, um, <laughs> I to I had to call into my office, her mother called me and said, um, told me something, I had to call her into office because on the 26th. We go to Atlanta and we do something very similar. And we're bringing many of our bridge builders. That's our group of Washington High School students who we work with, Dr. Otis Head, uh, leads that program. And so we're bringing the honors program students who actually work with the um, bridge builders with the group of Washington High School students and a couple of students from Tim's, uh, that's the Tuskegee Institute Middle School. We take them to, um, we take them to the city of Atlanta as we present on, on more dilemmas children of children and adolescents. So anyway, so the so city was coming, but then she, her mother said, but there's a conflict that she's very, very concerned because she wants to be there. But she was invited to another university because they are really going after her. Said, I can't remember this what she said. Like I said, I can't pronounce the words of the kind of stuff that these students are studying. But nevertheless, she was conflicted about going because I have certain rules in place about what honor students must do. I said, this is what honor students must do. <laughs> Going to other universities and representing and presenting yourself, that is the highest level of what we are supposed to be about in, uh, in, in, in collaboration with our community service and helping other people. That's extremely uh, what Jesus saw me do. So this guy made a second hand, I told her, please smile. I, so we help her to smile. She just looks like I'm just so focused. I want you to be smiling. So when she comes, give her a wonderful hand clap. Let her know that she's welcome. Miss Sydney has to present and moderate our work le lecturers for today. Come on, Miss Sydney. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Today I will be moderating for this session and I will begin by introducing the keynote for this morning. Uh, Dr. Noel L. Erickson, it, he teaches theology and ethics at Candler in Emory, Graduate Division of Religion. He came to Candler in 1977 and has been a visiting professor at 10 schools in six countries. His research interests include Caribbean black theologies, the history and development of plantation and black churches, and theological method in the work of James Cone, Karl Barth, Paul Tillich, and Dietrich Bonnefer. 
Erickson has authored and edited 11 books, all of which chronicle the historical and complex nature of black theology, revivalism, Rastafarianism, and the theological perspective of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In his most recent book, Plantation Church, How African American Religion Was Born in Caribbean Slavery, Erskine investigates the history of black churches both in the Caribbean and the United States after the arrival of enslaved Africans. In addition, he has contributed to scores of four journals, magazines, and anthologies, and is a sought-after lecturer and presenter. Without further ado, Dr. You're leaving the world much better than you found it. Could you put your hands together? And to my mentor, Dr. Hodge. He thinks I'm his mentor, but he's my mentor. And uh, you, you know, um, I, I like to say that in him, Emory University has sent you its best. And he is first rate. Give God a hand. And I, I must tell you, I'm very humbled to be here. Um, Tuskegee reminds me of Jamaica. When I drove in and saw the countryside, I just felt like I was home. I just want to give God thanks for this history and for what it means to be in this space. I'm going to ask you to bear with me a little bit. Um, I earn my living saying a whole lot of big words. Most of them I don't know what they mean. But they pay me good to say those big words. <laughs> it's kind of hard not to use them. So if you hear me using some big words, just say, that Negro just think he's back at Emory. <laughs> but I'm, I'm so honored. I'm so honored to be here. Um, We'll see how it works. I, I aim to go for about half an hour or so, and um, maybe if, if I see anybody dozing off, I'll start shouting. If you shout, <laughs> just pinch yourself to see if you're sleeping. <laughs> but thank you very much for being here. And the topic given to me is ethics of reconciliation. So let me say a few words and see what you think. Often we are reminded that slavery is America's original sin. Original sin in this context means that slavery is foundational to the American experience. The truth is that when you look at the history of black-white relationships in this country in particular, and in the new world in general, the fate of black lives, beginning with the capture of black people in Africa, to loading them on ships to cross the Middle Passage for their sale in the new world, that was sin against God and against humanity. The sin of slavery was the rupture of the relationship of our ancestors from their families, from their land, from their religions, and from their way of life. The Bible teaches that sin is not an isolated act that we are able to bracket and then move on. But sin is like a mighty Niagara Falls that cascades down the dangerous slopes of new world slavery and sin engulfs us all. Sin affects our institutions. It affects the American constitution or culture. 
given us greed that birthed capitalism as source of our social and economic injustice. Anglo-Americans or white Americans missed the truth about humanity when they encountered Africans' children and first Americans in the New World. The truth that human beings were created for justice and love, that our mode of being in the world should be governed by an ethic of justice and an ethic of care rather than an ethic of alienation and the othering of Africa's children. Scripture reminds us the wage sin pays is death. And this death infects our morality, our worldviews, all of society. This sin gets into our bloodstream, the bloodstream of our socio-political worldviews and it causes death. <clears throat> the white man proved incapable of doing justice and love to those who were different from him. An important aspect of the original sin of slavery was the failure of the enslaver to do justice and to practice kindness towards Africa's children. I must confess to you that as the great grandson of enslaved persons in the Caribbean, I have visited Africa several times in attempts to trace the roots of my genealogical tree and have been surprised how shallow those roots are. The loss of language. This is the biggest loss that us as children of African ancestors, this is our biggest loss. And I would argue that the kind of oppression that African Americans experience is even more severe than what American Indians experience. Let me explain for a minute. That the problem us children of Africa have in this world is we lost our language. And with the loss of language, we lost our culture. Unlike or American Indian brothers and sisters. They didn't lose their language. And because they didn't lose their language, they didn't lose their culture. And so when their backs were against the wall, they could piggyback into their culture. And in that culture, they could find some bias and a sense of identity. We, we are so lost. And that's why in reading the literature, I had to be crossing out Negro, Negro, Negro. Because one day we're Negro, one day we're Africans, another day we're African Americans. Sometimes we're not sure where we are. And part of the problem is the loss of language. The loss of language and culture has been a great obstacle as it excluded me from customs, rituals, and practices that would help us identify where we are. I've been to Africa so many times and it's embarrassing, you know, you sit at the table and they get down into that beautiful language, you know? And, 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 and you can't make sense of it. All, all we got is this English thing. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's painful. The loss of language, the loss of even your name, you know? And this has been one of the traumas that we experience. We can't find 
or rules. Uh, you know, I, I, I end up with a name like Erskine for crying out loud. Where the hell did that, where did that name go? You know, that ain't no African name. You end up with a name, you know? The loss, the loss of name. That, that's part of our dilemma. We, 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 we weren't allowed to honor the name of our parents. Lost even a sense of honor. Erskine. When I researched the name, I discovered it was some old slave master in Jamaica. Okay. From Scotland. I researched it. Would have been so nice if I had a beautiful name like Sankofa or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the trauma of slavery messed us up. Here is a story from an African sister who says that as an enslaved person, she says one day she was called by the master to Miss Ada's birthday party. Master Bob, she said, was her master who called her to Miss Ada's birthday party. Master Bob sort of looked out the corner of his eyes, first at me, then at Miss Ada. And then he made a little speech. It was Miss Ada's birthday party. He took my hand, put it in Miss Ada's hand, and says to Miss Ada, this is your birthday present, darling. I made a curtsy. And Miss Ada's eye twinkled like a star. And she take me in the room, and she had a powerful opening. So many sisters tell stories like that. Bob Marley, that great Jamaican reggae artist, introduces us to a Sankofa moment as Africa's children are encouraged to look back on the evils of slavery, yet forward to our hands being strengthened by the hand of the Almighty as we chart our way forward. Old pirates, yes, they rob I, sold I to the merchant ships, minutes after they took I from the bottomless pit. But my hand was made strong by the hand of the Almighty. We forward in this generation triumphantly won't you help to sing these songs of freedom cause all I ever had redemption songs redemption songs emancipate yourself from mental slavery none but ourselves can free our minds have no fear for atomic energy because none of them can stop the time. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Some say it's just a part of it. We have got to fulfill the book. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Because all I ever had, redemption songs. Redemption song. The song was always out of the reach of the master, out of the reach of the enslaver. Bob Marley suggests that black religion should contribute to the emancipation and liberation of black people. Reggae, as one aspect of black religion, expresses itself in racial uplift, the awakening of black consciousness, and its refusal to imitate patterns of behavior that will perpetuate the status quo. The black community is called on to reject status quo economics, politics, and social relations. Marley's redemption song urges us, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. 
This points to the need not only for emancipation from external oppression found in Western culture, but also for liberation from internal bondage and the cultivation of an alternative consciousness. Marley assures the community and the individual that emancipation from inner struggles and outer dilemmas in a world with, where the threat of nuclear wars are real points to the hand of the Almighty that will free victims not only from social and economic bondage, but also from mental slavery on the journey toward liberation. The point to keep in mind is that the journey to reconciliation helps us understand that justice and care should not be separated. If justice points to resistance and fairness in the social and economic spheres that do not work for black people, an ethic of care points to the need to recover and in some cases discover our beautiful black selves. When we care enough, we demand justice. Justice is required from all who benefit from the structures of slavery. Reparations must be for the suffering of African Americans who, because of slavery, have been kept from full membership in the socioeconomic community. Great injury has been committed against African Americans during slavery, and repentance as reparations is required from the United States of America. I like saying that part. <laughs> yes, repentance as reparations is required from the United States of America. Reparations must include restitution and a national apology in the form of repentance. Music becomes a mode of resistance against all that would encroach on the freedom of the self to affirm justice. Now I must tell you that, that often when I hear grandma says when some great harm comes to the family and grandma says, I, 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 I forgive him. You know, like in South Carolina when, you remember that? white fellow went to the church and killed up all those people. And I couldn't understand it. The folks came out. I mean, your husband shot, your, kid, your child is killed in the church. And she said, I, I forgive him. I forgive him. I forgive him. And I said, oh, Lord, that, that forgiveness is too quick. <laughs> but you know what I discovered? And tell me if you agree with me later on. I discovered that Grandma was right. Yes. Because you see, forgiveness is different from repentance. Yes. Forgiveness is not about the person who did the harm. That's right. It's about the person who experienced the harm. Yes. And, and forgiveness has to do with who we are. That's who I am. I'm a child of God and I offer forgiveness. But, but forgiveness don't mean I'm going to go to bed with you now. Forgiveness don't mean we're being reconciled. Right. Forgiveness don't mean we're about to get married. Forgiveness means there's room now for repentance. Yes. If you don't repent, we can't be reconciled. That's it right there. So there's a prophet. Grandma is right. I'll forgive you. But that don't mean we're about to get married. Don't, don't start celebrating now. You need to, you need to get on with repentance. And repentance means reparation. You've done some harm. There's need for restitution. And there's need. And now, brother, thank you for letting me do this, man. I, I, I stumbled on it. I said, thank you, Jesus. I'm willing to forgive anybody. If I see you going across the road and a car coming, I'll help you get out of the way. But don't think you're coming home with me now. <laughs> I'm ready for you to go home with me now. You've got some work to do. Repent. <laughs> what if I got on my Baptist road and said, I'm being baptized. That's the remission of your sins, every one of you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I tell you that, that, that was, that was, ooh, that, I had to go all day 
about that. The difference between forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation. I'll come to that a little more. So let's talk about the body. We can't talk about bioethics without talk about the body. The body as the site of liberation and reconciliation. A retrieval of the history of black people in the New World reminds us that the body of enslaved Africans for several hundred years belonged to the enslaver. The body belonged to the master. During the period of New World slavery, the enslaver, the slave master, I like to call him the enslaver, the enslaver had the right to whip to sell, to brutalize the body of African Americans as he saw fit. My God, you know, master could rape your wife. You, know, you raise your hand, you got killed. You know, so many a husband knew what was going on and couldn't couldn't raise a hand, cause 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 the body the body didn't belong to you. It belonged to. To, to the master. In much of our literature, we really address this aspect of the body. The reality that black people, the black man and the black woman, never really owned their bodies. We get a sense today of what this means when we look at the prison system. Did you know we have over two million? Listen to me now. We got over two million people in jails. I couldn't believe it, like 2.2 million. And most of them are us, colored folks. It's all about injustice. I think black folks ain't no, you know, we ain't, that, we ain't worse than white folk. We are just folk. You know? And folks sin. You know, we all mess up. We all mess up. In fact, they're saying that the young white kids use more dope than, than black kids. Because they can afford to buy it. And yet the jails are full of us. You know? And, and so our bodies, our bodies, our bodies don't belong to us. The situation was terrible for women who were considered the property of the master. The master who could rape and abuse them at will. And, and, and so it was for so many others. Black bodies were lynched, swinging in the, in the wind. Many preachers who condone slavery would preach this bad theology that, that the soul belonged to God and the body belonged to the master. You believe that? You go to church and hear that kind of nonsense. I still preach that kind of nonsense in church. <laughs> yeah, they ain't talking the truth about the body. Enslaved people became impatient with slavery because somehow they knew that God meant them for freedom. The body, you know, you know, it scares me that even, even in your mother's womb, even the baby in the womb belonged to the master. Yes, yes. Did that! Yes. And that's why I'm not making excuses for black men, but one of the problems black men have is that they never came from a history in which we had to honor, honor the father. Because the master took that place and passed that. And you know, you know, people say, leave slavery alone. But, but my God, my, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great grandson. I knew my granddaddy, my, my grandfather. He used to tell me about his daddy who was a slave. So we're not that far removed from it. You know? And, and it, 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 it does its generational thing on us. Imagine that. Your own, your own. The baby in the mother's womb. That child grows up with a name that belongs to the master. Okay, let me get on to the question of reconciliation. When Dr. J. Diotis Roberts, a great Baptist African-American theologian, wrote a book in 1971, his book was called Liberation 
and reconciliation of black theology. And he was celebrated as a great theologian of reconciliation because in the 70s, you know, after Martin Luther King was killed 68 and, and um, we, we, we had Malcolm 65, you know, people were really following the doldrums. We weren't really in the mood to you know, talk about reconciliation. We were in the mood to talk about liberation and, and reparations. But here comes this brother with this book talking about uh, 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 reconciliation. I remember I was in school in the 70s and a professor there called James Cone, he said that the Otis Roberts got it wrong. That, that, that talk about, he said, talk about reconciliation right after Martin is killed and Malcolm killed and all the crazy stuff going on. Cohn says, talk about reconciliation is premature. Mm -hmm. And so the question I have for all of you today is this one. Is it premature? I ask you, is the call for is is the call for reconciliation with white people premature? And, and, and this is 2019. I want you young people to help me out. Lord knows I need some help. <laughs> it is, 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 it, is it too soon to talk about reconciliation? Remember my teacher at Union Theological Seminary, Professor James Cohn, he said, he said, he said, you know, you know, Erskine, reconciliation is an eschatological possibility. Maybe when we get to heaven by and by, we get reconciled up there. But right down here now, we are ready to talk about that. But that was a long time ago. This is 2019. All right. All right. And I'm asking you to help me. Are we ready? Yeah. Is it premature to talk about reconciliation with white people? So let me give you some, 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 some stuff to help the conversation. Talk about political and economic dimensions of reconciliation has to be in the context of affirming the full humanity of black people. In other words, if I'm going to talk reconciliation with you, you have to regard me as a full human being. Yes. Yes. That we have to come to the table as brothers and sisters. And so that's one thing we, we, we have to, to keep in mind. There, 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 there should not be a big imbalance in power. I, I don't know. For example, I, I don't know how, how Harvard, you know, Harvard is that big. What I got? Last time I checked, like $40 billion in the kitty. B with a B, you know, B. <laughs> now, 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 what would it mean for Harvard to be reconciled to Tuskegee? Come on, sir. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you look at the imbalance of power, I don't know. I would have to be willing to share some of what they got with us first, bring us up with power, because there's too much of an imbalance of power. So questions about, about reconciliation raises the question of power. Maybe, maybe there needs to be a redistribution of power. Yeah, yeah. That is why there is a necessity for reparations. As Marcus Garvey said, Marcus Garvey says, you can't come to the table to talk about reconciliation with your hat in your hand. Uh, you know, the, hand, the, the hat is the old time thing that you take, take a collection, you go to church and then a collection, but you use a hat. <laughs> <laughs> you remember those days? You're not old enough to know that. <laughs> my, my boy, who, lots of time, you know, he wasn't even supposed to be collection, and the reverend came up with the idea, hey, that's a good collection. Let's take a collection. Say, anybody got a hat? And <laughs> Marcus Garvey said, you can't go to the table to talk about reconciliation with your hat in your hand. You've got to come with stuff. All right. you know? And that is part of the problem. Yes. 
You know, how you gonna be reconciled with folks who own Wall Street mm -hmm. and who own Silicon Valley? And we can't keep black colleges open. Mm -hmm. Look at Morris Brown up there in Atlanta, where I come from. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't keep our black colleges open. And, 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 and so and so in the 70s, brother Dr. Roberts didn't get a good hearing <coughs> because people were saying he's not paying attention to what's happening in the black community and he's too quick to talk about reconciliation. Let me quote from Dr. Roberts, he says, whites must now be ready to work with blacks for better racial understanding. Reconciliation must be based on a oneness in nature and grace between all people upon the principle of equity. Equality belongs to the time of integration. It assumes that blacks must earn the right to be, he's crazy, he doesn't black. <laughs> hey, I mean, he's my friend, but you know, he just white, not right and straight. He, he, he says, he, he, he says black, blacks must earn, can you believe that? Blacks must earn the right to be, where is that come from? What kind of right we must earn? Blacks must earn the right to be equal, to be accepted in the American, if they don't want to accept you like that, let me go on about the business. I <laughs> heard the brother, he, he kind of mixed up there. <laughs> so, you know, equity, we, we, you see, and, and what is missing here, what is missing here is the language of repentance. You want to have a conversation with white folk about reconciliation? The first thing is, you must be born again, bro. That's why I love Jesus. Because Jesus walks into town and Jesus says, repent. First word, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. If we're going to talk about the kingdom of God, you've got to change direction. That's what the word metanoia means, repentance. <laughs> change the direction. You're going in the wrong direction. Turn your life around. Oh, we're not going to have no conversation. I mean, you know, that's his foot on your neck. He died big old foot with big old boots on, you know. <laughs> when did I stop eating this morning and I saw this man with big old, I said, look at me, Alabama boots. He had a big old boots. <laughs> But you should please sir, please nice gentleman, would you kindly take your foot off my neck? That's not gonna work! <laughs> Repent! Oh, I love that language. And that's, oh my friend, my friend got it wrong. My friend got it so wrong, you know, so let me, let me go on to the end and say that one reason why I love Martin Luther King Jr. and that it would have been good for Dr. Roberts to listen to Martin Luther King Jr. because listen to Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from the Birmingham jail in 1963. He says, I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. Mm. I have almost reached a regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner. Ain't that something? Martin, there's something else. He said, my problem ain't the Ku Klux Klaner because he ain't no hypocrite. That's right. At least I know where he is. He ain't got on no suit. He ain't got on white sheep. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, you know, he's not hiding that. He said, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. That's it. Law and order. They're not into justice. They want law and order. And King says, the, the moderate who says constantly, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action. Who paternalistically feels 
that he can set the timetable for another person's freedom. I like that. Mm -hmm. A whole lot of folks think they can set a timetable for your freedom. Mm -hmm. Who lives by the myth of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season? Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And what we get in Martin Luther King Jr. is the language of repentance. And, and, and that is what we need to, to lift up. Repentance as reparations. That is the key. Reparations would be a form of repentance by the state, in this case the United States, for enforced labor of black people. Can you see, black folks had to work for white people without pay, and, and, and that was enforced by the police, by the police state. You know, I remember, you, 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 you know, they, 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 they arrested um, Richard Allen up there in Philadelphia when he was preaching up there. Because the, in the old days, it was your word against the white man. So the white man could just arrest you and say, you my slave. And, and if you went to court, your word didn't mean nothing. It's the white man's word. But everybody in Philadelphia knew Richard Allen, man, arrest me, he my slave. And everybody said, no, 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 we know, that's Richard Allen. We know Richard Allen. <laughs> they had to let him go. You know, so 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 we have had to live with all of that stuff. You know, reparations should be a way for the United States to say to black people, "We're sorry. We're sorry for what this country did to you." Reparations would be a way to help us in healing and moving forward. Let me let me wrap this up so we can move on. I think. Um, let me go on to say that uh, there was this enslaved brother called Jordan who um, got his own freedom in 1864 and moved to live in Dayton, Ohio in 1865. And while there in 1865, <clears throat> his former boss, a fellow called Colonel Anderson wrote him and invited him to come back to work with him and to live with him. And uh, this former enslaved brother, Jordan, his name is J-O-U-R-D-O-N, Brother Jordan, former enslaved man, writes to his former slave master. I just want to read that piece of letter and wrap this up. <clears throat> Listen to the letter that uh, this enslaved brother Jordan writes to his former master. He says, Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you had not forgotten Jordan and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better for me than anybody else can. I want to know particularly what the good chance is you propose to give me. I am doing tolerably well here. I get $25 a month with Vickers, you remember that old time word, that old Bible word, the I-C-T-U-A-L, food with Vickers, and clothing. Have a comfortable home for Mandy. I, I like that brother, any brother who mentions his wife's name. Yeah. Please, if you talk to my wife, tell her I, 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 I mentioned that. <laughs> I, I like that, the brother include his wife. He, he, that's a good sign. He said, he said I, I, I have a comfortable home for Mandy. The folks here call her Mrs. Anderson. Oh. And the children, Millie Jane and Grundy, go to school and are learning well. Now, if you will write and say what wages you will give me, I will be better able to decide whether it will be to my advantage to move back 
again. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there's nothing to be gained on that score, as I got my freedom papers in 1864 from Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville. Mandy, that's his wife, Mandy says she would be afraid to go back without some proof that you were disposed to treat us justly and kindly. And we have concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. <laughs> Listen to the brother now. Listen to the brother. He said, I served you faithfully for 32 years. And my wife, Mandy, served you for 20 years. At $25 a month for me, and $2 a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to $11,680. Now, brother could have his pencil. <laughs> Added to this, the interest oh, wow. for the time our wages have been kept back. When you talk to Mr. Chuck, when you say Mr. Chuck, tell him about the interest. <laughs> and deduct what you have paid for our clothing, three doctors visit to me, and pulling a tooth for Mandy, and the balance will show what we are in justice entitled to. Please send the money by Adams Express <laughs> in care of B. Winters Esquire, Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> If you fail to pay us for our faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith in your promises for the future. We trust the good maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers in making us toil for you for generations without recompense. Surely there will be a day of reckoning for those who defraud the laborer of his hire. Amen. You know the rest of the story. The colonel never responded to that letter. He could have responded. Millions and millions of black people have had their labor stolen from them. And because of this, the futures of black people and their progeny have been closed. And so when we talk about reconciliation, we have to realize that perhaps as a first step, we need to be reconciled to one another. Yes. Yes. I think we should begin just in this room the person beside you, with each other. And then together, as we get reconciled among ourselves, then together we'll be able to approach others and seek further reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. We will now have the respondent, Dr. Ann Gallagher. Dr. Ann Gallagher is Professor of Ethics and Care, International Care Ethics Observatory, School of Health Sciences in the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, and trained as a general nurse at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast during the Troubles. She moved to England to pursue post-registration training as a mental health nurse. Following practice experience in elder care and adolescent psychiatry, and completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in Philosophy and Health Studies in London. She went on to complete a Master's in Medical and Social Ethics at the University of Wales College of Cardiff and a PhD in Professional Ethics at the University of Central Lancashire, 
under the supervision of Professor Ruth Chadwick and has extensive experience as a care ethicist, nurse, educator, researcher, and editor. Anne has recently been on sabbatical exploring cross-cultural perspectives on ethics and elder care. She was Fulbright Scholar in Residence at the National Center of Bioethics and Research in Healthcare at the University of Tuskegee in 2017. Without further ado, Dr. Gallagher. Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here, but Dr. Erskine, I, I cannot follow that. No. <laughs> I just cannot do it. Okay, so thank you to Dr. Warren, Dr. Hodge, and the Bioethics Committee for inviting me back. It's just wonderful to be here. A huge privilege to be amongst the descendants in particular and the bioethics community. I have I have traveled a lot and I have learned and laughed more at Tuskegee than <coughs> anywhere else in the world. That is so, so true. So I'm going to start with, just a little bit before I engage with your talk, just a little bit about what I've learned and also some of the joyful surprises I've had here that I think will make you laugh. So what I've learned first of all, so when I worked with Dr. Warren, he invited me to write a commentary. And in my usual academic way, I write a, you know, a very objective commentary drawn on the literature. And I gave him a first draft, and I could tell he wasn't very happy. So he said, do a bit more, I do a bit more. Second draft, he still wasn't happy. <laughs> so I thought, well, what's wrong with this? And he said, he said, where are you in this? Where are you in this? That was a complete revelation and epiphany. I've spent my academic career not talking about me or who I am or where I come from. And when I came to Tuskegee, I realized you have to engage with who you are and where you come from to do what you do. So that is a huge learning. And I, he said I would never be the same again. I have never been the same, been the same again. So that's it. In terms of the joyful surprises, I've had amazing times here. The joyful surprises started before I even got here. I got the shuttle bus from Atlanta. And it turned out that the driver was a PhD in agriculture. And I said, where are you from? And he said, oh, no, he said, where, he said to me, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from Ireland. Now, you need to know that Ireland is half the size of, of Alabama. It's a small country. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, he said, I know all about the great famine of the 1840s. And I thought, <laughs> wow. So he told me about the famine, and he knew more about the Irish famine than I did. So this is straight up. A million Irish people died because there was a potato blight. A million emigrated. They talked about famine ships that went from Ireland to America. They called them coffin ships because many people died on the way. Now that's African American colleague knew more about my Irish culture than I did. So it really reminds me I need to engage more with my history. And the second example on a, on a lighter note, I was in Piggly Wiggly about 10 days after. <laughs> And I was doing my grocery shopping, and I walked everywhere, so I looked at maybe a little bit eccentric. Anyway, I hear someone call my name, and I think, no. You know, I've just arrived, how can anyone, no. So I hear Dr. Gallagher, Dr. Gallagher. And I turned around, and there's a lady from the bank, and she said, Dr. Gallagher, I just want to tell you, we have your bank card in, and if you come in on Monday, you can pick it up. That would never happen in England. <laughs> never. So I got a measure of Tuskegee. Um, and just another, just very quick anecdote. I, I was required to do a Fulbright lecture, and you're supposed to do something of your culture. Now, I can't do very much, but I can play the piano accordion, which is sort of quirky, isn't it? So I was on the, with Dr. Hell, I went with the bridge builders, and I met the driver, Mr. Trammell. I don't know if he's here. Oh, yeah, he is. And I said to um, Mr. Trammell, you don't know where I could get a piano accordion? <laughs> And uh, he said, leave it with me. The next evening, he turned up at James Hall with a piano accordion, <laughs> straight up. And I played the accordion with two drummers from the Tuskegee uh, band, two young women. So, my God, you, the most amazing things happened here. And I just, it was just such a joyful time. And the last one is this morning. This, this, I went to the gym this morning. And there was a Hollywood, this is straight up, there was a Hollywood film crew over by Logan Hall. Uh, half past six in the morning. So I went to the gym, and I was on the, the cross train, and the guy beside me, um, Coach Carter, I said, what's happening outside? He said, oh, he said, he said, oh, Spike Lee here is making some kind of movie, and he just carried on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God! Spike Lee is on campus, and everything's just really cool. Um, so, um, and then the fifth, that's not the last thing is, this morning I got here, and this colleague has 
just given me. Oh. <laughs> so, so where is she? Vegan, I get an Irish t-shirt, well, oh my god, so things go full circle. Um, this, this Tuskegee is an amazing place, I, I love it, I love Alabama, I love the people, and it seems to me you just take everything in your stride, nothing will surprise you, and you see good in everything, and you've had a terrible history, but you're making some good of that, so I have huge respect, and I just feel so privileged, and I will do everything I can to spread the word about the good work, but now I need to get back to Dr. Erskine's talk. <laughs> So uh, it was my pleasure to it is my pleasure to respond to the important keynote address by Dr. Erskine. Dr. Erskine's keynote is interesting in that it illuminates the conference theme by drawing together insights from multidisciplinary scholarship. Historical and, the and theological accounts of the reality of slavery are hard hitting. There is reference to the original sin of slavery, which is foundational to the American experience. He reminds us that this year, 2019, marks the 400th anniversary of the, right of, of the arrival of the first African slaves to America. Dr. Erskine writes of African persons who are branded, transported, depersonalized, and sold as beasts of burden. Dr. Erskine shares his own story of roots that could not be traced, of his loss of self, and of the profound sense of loss, identity, powerlessness, and helplessness that the trauma of slavery evokes. He refers to Bob Marley's Sankofa moment and to the words of his redemption song, and I cannot say. Yes, you can. <laughs> no, <laughs> he said, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. Name none but your ourselves can free our minds. Mm -hmm. That is a sentiment that probably everyone here can relate to. Dr. Erskine's keynote address highlights the horror and depravity of slavery with references to rape, lynching, deprivation of freedom, and extreme cruelty. His talk serves as a stark reminder that racism, inequality, and an imbalance of power and, um, and discrimination continue. Dr. Erskine refers to questions of love and justice as hanging in the balance. He talks of the work of Dr. Roberts, a theologian of liberation, and of his argument that the theological and the sociological must be conjoined. In this response, my, will be, my focus will be on the, the empirical and the ethical. What I will attempt to conjoin, to bring together, are questions relating to the is and the ought of our personal and professional lives, drawing on scholarship from applied ethics. So in terms of ethics and care, there's not a lot of work. There's a lot of scholarship and scholarship in this field. And researchers are very engaged in understanding and measuring the moral life in relation to professional practice. And my area is primarily health and social care. There's much qualitative work describing and analyzing aspects of, for example, the process of consent, of confidentiality, and truth-telling. There are also, you may be surprised to know, many attempts to measure the moral life. So people have developed and validated tools to measure moral distress, organizational culture, um, dignity, and professional values. Predating this and alongside this, there's been a very um, strong historical um, collection of papers and books in relation to nursing ethics in particular. And my university, we've just been given, we've just been gifted uh, the biggest collection of historical books on um, nursing ethics from the, 18, from the late 1800s, which is really exciting. So much has changed in care, but much has also, also remained the same. For example, the aspiration to be the best possible caregiver. One early 20th century author, uh, her name is, is Rob, uh, she, she writes of a letter she received asking for a recommendation for a chief nurse. The letter ended with this statement, in short, we require an intelligent saint. So a few of us could, could measure up to that. Dr. Erskine's assertion that the point to keep in mind is that justice and care should not be separated and he draws attention to a very lively debate regarding the content and focus of an ethics of care. In the 1980s, Carl Gilligan and Nell Noddings challenged the research of moral psychologist Lawrence Colbert by drawing attention to the role of care, of gender, and of context in ethics. Since then, there's been abundance of activity 
and there's fields developing called, some people call it care ethics, other people call it ethics of care. And I have to say, the field of ethics is applied to care is broader still. So there's a lot of literature in this area. So one approach to ethics and care that has received a lot of attention in recent years is that of American political philosopher Joan Tronto. Some features of her scholarship are particularly illuminating in relation to Dr. Erskine's address and to the theme of reconciliation and reparation. Tronto writes, she said that care is the work that sustains life. It doesn't get any more important than that. She writes the four features of care and the associated ethical attitude, and everybody in this room will know something about these phases. So the first one is caring about. She said this involves the recognition that care is necessary and it includes, includes concern, worry about someone or something. And the ethical attitude there is attentiveness. And you demonstrate this every day in your response to other humans. So that's caring about. The second one is taking care of. So this is the next step of the caring process. So it involves taking responsibility for tasks related to the provision of care. So you may not actively give the care with your own hands, but you will arrange care. So this week I visited a wonderful lady in her 90s who was being cared for by a, a, just a fantastic caregiver, and that care was arranged by her family. So that's taking care of. The third one is caregiving, and that's direct caregiving. So everyone here who's cared for uh, children, um, family members, elders know about that. So it's a direct meeting of care needs. And that's about it requires certain competence. The fourth one is care receiving, and we often forget about that. It's about having the right attitude to receiving care. And often we're not very good at that, acknowledging that we are on the receiving end. And there's an ethical, uh, um, ethical attitude of responsiveness there. How do we respond in the right way to acknowledge that we're very grateful for the receiving of care? So each of these has implications for the way we treat each other. There is then an abundance of insights from the field of ethics that throws light on our moral lives and provides background to the odds and choose in terms of our relationships with other communities, with other citizens, with students, family and friends. <coughs> so questions are, in fact we, when we went to the, um, on, on our outing yesterday to learn about the Tuskegee Airmen, some of the conversations I had with Mrs Carmichael and other colleagues, we touched on this. So the questions are, why don't we act ethically all the time? When we know what is right, why don't we do it? Why do violations of human rights happen? Why do we continue in 2019 to have reports of child abuse, of slavery, discrimination, abuse, neglect, exploitation, and misconduct in public and professional life? These are challenging questions that will evoke a range of responses. They're conundrums that we need to apply our best hearts and minds to. Work by social psychologists, for example, provide insights about the impact of unethical or what call toxic cultures on individuals. So we, we learn from that that good people can be made to do bad things if they work in a toxic culture. Not all, but some. But also work by, from philosophers. Uh, one book that I really like is by uh, W.J. Warnock, 1971. Uh, he argues that we need ethics and morality for three reasons. Because we as humans are limited in sympathy, we're limited in rationality, and we may be in competition with each other. So these are sort of good reasons to help us understand why sometimes we find it difficult to do the right thing. So um, one, re one constructive response to wrongs, and uh, I'll come back to whether we can write wrongs in just a minute, uh, that I would draw attention to is the role of ethics education. For years I've been teaching research to ethics, and I always, always talk about the USPHSSS, the study that you're so um, involved in and know, know so much about. So there's much potential for a range of ethics education innovations. So we, we've done a lot of things at Surrey. We've reflected groups in residential care homes. We have immersive simulation. And that's really exciting because what we do is we bring the caregivers into the university and they become care recipients. Now can you imagine, so you're a nurse and you come in and you receive care from one of our students and you allow the student to give you a bed bath and to give you a shower and to feed you that is really, that's also the stuff of epiphanies. And some people became very upset because they said, I didn't realize that I wasn't really a very good caregiver until I know what it's like to be in the receiving end. So that's one thing we do, uh, which is immersive simulation. And we're also developing an online course at the moment, a MOOC. So just to move on and, and come to the end, uh, during my Fulbright uh, scholarship here at Tuskegee, I had the opportunity to visit the Civil and Human Rights Museum in Atlanta. 
And the quotes that some of you may have experienced that was particularly memorable for me uh, related to the simulated experience of the diner. Do you know that? So you put the headphones on and you sit on a stool and you experience verbal abuse and you feel as if your chair has been kicked. That is just so impactful. So this, you might say, bears a poor resemblance to the day-to-day -day experience of people on the receiving end of discrimination, and you would be right. Uh, Dr. Erskine referred to Dr. King's criticism of people who are passive. He writes, of shallow understanding for people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding for people of ill will. That's, strong, that's a strong statement. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Move into a deeper understanding of the history and presence of slavery, discrimination, and dehumanization is a task for all of us. The Atlanta diner experience will not be sufficient to inspire activism. However, it is impactful and alongside historical and contemporary education about human and civil rights and the wrongs of the past will enable us to move forward, at least to some extent. So can we right the wrongs of the past? There have been many examples of past and recent wrongs, most significantly here, the wrongs of slavery and of research misconduct. Nothing we do will undo the suffering that those people experienced in the past. However, we have the opportunity here to learn from the past and to contribute to a better future. This week I've had the privilege of meeting with the families of men who were made to suffer, to endure suffering as part of the United States Public Health Service syphilis study, Tuskegee. Witnessing their sense of responsibility regarding the legacy of the study was truly humbling. Witnessing also the positivity of the award ceremony on Monday was totally uplifting. They show us the way forward and they pave the way for a better future for all of us. So just to conclude, engaging with and responding to Dr. Erskine's keynote address has been a very valuable and humbling experience. It also evokes some anxiety regarding my role and responsibility in this gathering. Perhaps I feared I might be labelled that white moderate who's more devoted to order than justice. The anxiety stimulated fruitful reflection. I have not had the experience of the profound sense of loss and identity described by Dr. Erskine and other African Americans. Until I came to Tuskegee, my shallow understanding of slavery, segregation, and racial discrimination had been informed by viewing the TV series Roots, you may remember, in the 1970s. And to more recent documentaries, academic writing, and movies on these themes. Since coming to Tuskegee, however, my understanding has become broader and deeper. I also now better appreciate, for example, connections between civil rights activism in the 1960s and 1970s in my home country, Ireland, which were inspired by Dr. King here in the southern states. That was a recent uh, discovery on my part. Towards the end of his address, Dr. Erskine states that we must go on to affirm that reconciliation includes acknowledgement of the problems of racism, sexism, classism, and the need for restitution, reparation, and at the end of this process, rec reconciliation. He includes that there's much work to be done in order to get to reconciliation with the descendants of those who enslaved our ancestors. He said, perhaps a first step is to work on reconciliation among ourselves. That's a very important point. So I just want to finish with a quotation that I find very helpful. And in fact, I've never been able to trace where it came from, but it might resonate with you. So the quotation is, each of us is like all other people, like most other people, like some other people, like no other people. So each of us is like all other people, like most other people, like some other people, and like no other people. We are all so unique at the end of the day. Remembering this and enacting the ethical values of care, dignity, solidarity, justice, and kindness, and love should underpin all we do to ensure future generations can flourish and live happily together. These are values that underpin everything that happens to speak in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. We will now have questions for either Dr. Erskine or Dr. Gallagher. 
I would like to ask the first question. <laughs> so therefore, I grab, I grab the mic quickly. <laughs> Before you want to grab a hold of it. My question is this. I am getting, I mean, I'm more concerned about how abstract reconciliation is. Because I've watched how abstract justice became. And in the early part of the 1900s, there was an ethicist by the name of Reinhold Niebuhr. Can you use the mic, sir? There's an ethicist by the name of Rhino. I, I sound so much more romantic <laughs> with the mic post. But there's an ethicist by the name of Rhino Lieber, who was a Christian pacifist. In other words, he was just leave it alone, it's okay, we should engage in certain kinds of things. But because Adolf Hitler was so bad, he switched from being a Christian pacifist to being a Christian realist. In other words, he said, we need to get involved. First, his position was, let's stay out of stuff. Then his position became, we need to get involved. Now, he never pushed Christian realism for black people as time went on. He said another thing, but he didn't make it engaging. Justice for him re re remained abstract and far away. I'm concerned if there is nothing in our talk and you brought something, Dr. Erskine, to the, down to the ground. But what else can we do to bring truth, the tr in truth and reconciliation, the truth part to the conversation so it doesn't become rhetoric, the public opinion, and never policy. So it is never fully engaged. Just every time the black people meet to have a conversation about how bad things are, rather than uh, that uh, a, a, a conversation taking place for those in power, like you mentioned, Donald Trump needs to understand the interests. That's not justice abstract, that's justice concrete. How do we make justice more concrete, reconciliation more concrete, so it, after we leave here, and other conversations, especially in this 400 year, then we leave with some real, measurable things taking place so that reparations can actually take place. I, I, I would begin by singing again. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. That's right. That's it. We have to begin with us. And we have to realize it's complicated because, as I said, um, Reconciliation is not just dealing with the stuff outside of us, but the stuff inside of us too. We have work to do on ourselves. And um, it's, more than, it's more than forgiveness. It's repentance. And we can take little, little steps. For example, and I know this is multiplying it by a large degree, I was learning yesterday that my friend Oprah Winfrey lives in a house that costs $90 million. Yes. And she has about half a dozen houses like that. And then after she has all of that, she still has over $3 billion left sitting somewhere. And I dream, talk about practicality. Would there be a way to bring some of those black folks together to recognize Tuskegee School could use some help? We got Morris Brown, Morris Brown School in Atlanta closed down. We got a lot, I mean, my God, I, I went to Morehouse the other day and I thought I was in Jamaica. They got some more broken down desks and chairs. I said, how could this be a murder? See, you know, it's like I was in the third world. So um, I think there's some practical steps we really need to take to remove this stuff between us that's separating us. You're right, it's complicated because one of the things we don't talk about as black people is class. 
that that maybe the race thing, you know, keeps both of us apart. The race thing that her whiteness represents superiority and my blackness historically represents inferiority. We got that race thing. But 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 what's invisible between us that is hard to point to is class. That you know, um, some of us wouldn't sleep in some of the little hotels around the place. You know, because your class prevents that. So, so, so the class analysis, and another big one that we don't want to talk about, is gayness, homophobia. I mean, look at the black church. The black church ain't talking about that. Or right. if it talks about it, all it knows to do is to condemn it. And so maybe the, one of the things the Bioethics Institute can do is help us how to have a conversation across these lines. Not just race, the race is kind of easy. But gender, the way we keep women out of leadership roles, the whole lot of stuff we need to do as a first step. And I still think the first step is the conversation among us in terms of what next steps are. Um. Checking out a whole lot. I mean, making it real, making it concrete. And there's a difference between recent wrongs and past wrongs, of course. <coughs> the truth reconciliation uh, process in South Africa, in my home country, there have been various initiatives to uh, call to account <coughs> people who did bad things during trouble, soldiers who shot civilians, and so on. I'm not sure that puts everything right. I suppose I'd say, and I always say, this education is, is the way forward. We educate people well with different perspectives. And I'm totally in agreement with Dr. Erskine, it's not just about race race, class, gender, sexual orientation, we need to think about all people in the different, we're not just one thing, none of us. So I'm truly, truly, I'm truly in sympathy. Past, further past wrongs, like slavery, I find, I'm not qualified to comment on, but I think education for me is the main and the most positive strategy in the way forward, educate our young people so they know better and are in a, better, in a good position to do better in the future. And we've got so many amazing young people in this audience, which is fantastic. Hello. Uh, this question. Okay. This question is for uh, Dr. Erskine. Um, you talked about Brother Malcolm and uh, Brother Martin, and then you also talked about the letter that uh, Brother Martin uh, wrote. Do you think that his feelings towards the moderate came from a uh, misplaced uh, trustworthiness that he had for them, versus how Brother Malcolm? His level of trustworthiness, and do you think that today um, black people have the? Do you think that is parallel to the level of trustworthiness black people have towards the liberals? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, there are different stages in the development of Martin King. Martin King began very young in his twenties, and uh, like a maybe typical twenty something year old, it was not just myopic, but romantic. He romanticized what was possible. And for a long time, he felt that all we needed was a slice of the American pie. That black people just needed their share. It, it, come to think of it, 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 it was a, 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 a clever way maybe of talking more reparations. If black people what's their due, black people owe something. Let, let's, you know, civil rights, human rights, and all of that kind of stuff. Malcolm was more the human rights. But to, to face your question, what happened to, to Martin is that at the end, that, that last year, after the Riverside speech on the Vietnam War, um, Martin increasingly became like Malcolm. In the end, Martin, Martin said, take your money out of the white banks, put them in black banks. There are lots of black insurance companies up here in Memphis. Take out your insurance there. Don't buy one the bread. They're not hiring, they're not hiring black people. If they don't treat us fair, we, 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 we won't be fair. So, so, Malcolm, so Martin changed. Martin changed. In the, in the end, he was saying, I really, 
I really don't think that race thing going work. You know, one interesting thing about Martin King, Martin King never told the black church to integrate. He never anywhere said, black churches, integrate. No, 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 no. He was smart enough to know that there was an emergency situation in America in which black folks needed to get together. Because how are you going to talk about power if, if your community is diffused? So he never did that. And in the end, the, the letter in his pocket, the sermon in his pocket, America is on its way to hell. <laughs> that, was the, that was the last, that was the notes he had in his pocket for his sermon. America is on its way to hell. So, you know, he, he, he began to see the light that, that the race thing wasn't going anywhere in the time soon. But do you think that um, today that black people still have that um, level of trustworthiness towards the, um, towards like liberals? It's hard to speak for black people. Yes. <laughs> If we have a congregation here, let me hear from you folks where you think, yes, yes, ma'am. I wonder if you would comment on a, a tension or a conflict I have experienced with lots of people I've never been able to resolve. Those who are absolutely devoted, I would say the intelligent saint, to individual care, and who on my deathbed would I would love to have for myself. Between those people and those others who are absolutely brilliant in understanding the big picture of social systemic policy and how that impacts the whole. And between the two, I don't find too much rapport. I have met school teachers who say, until you get what it takes to teach these individual lovely children, I will pay attention to your debates on a policy level about school bond issues. But until you get to my level of understanding why ratio of school teacher to children matter on my level, it's hard for me to pay attention to those big words that you're talking about on a policy level. And I have found that to be the same on race and justice issues. The folks who, are, who can crunch those numbers and say this is what it's going to take to win and overcome the enemy who are racists don't have much sympathy for people who say this is what it takes to be kind to one individual. I just would love for your comments. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, where, where to start? Uh, and I suppose it's about um, practice policy politics, isn't it? That intersect that relationship. I mean, one thing I would say, and you're probably expecting to say, is education absolutely is, is, is my usual response. Good education is, is a a wonderful um, just way to just enlighten people and kind of make them new kind of thing, but at least help them to understand the background. But research is another area. So currently we are engaged in a cross-cultural study with China on roles, responsibilities, and the future of care of older people. So I am a true believer in cross-cultural engagement, and I'm absolutely delighted that Dr. Warren is going to join us in England uh, in June. We're bringing uh, people together from 12 different countries, China, Japan, Singapore, the United States, Europe, and we're going to thrash out these issues together. So it's a bit indirect, but what we have in mind is three Ps. 
It's not just about practice, it's not just about policy, it's also philosophy. How do we think about these issues? How do we think about our practices? And yesterday, I think the new said, Dr. Carruthers mentioned Ubuntu, the African, we have to be very mindful as well that we, whoever we are, Americans or English or Irish, we have all the answers. We have a lot to gain from other cultures. So I'm very keen to learn from Chinese philosophy, from African philosophy. So these big questions of education or care, I think we have to engage with it all. And I think researchers, educators are well placed to do that. So absolutely, not just about practice, not just about policy, not just about politics or philosophy. It's all of that, and we need the best heads and minds and hearts at the table to do that. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, the question of care is a tricky one for black people, especially black women. Black women for a long time, including my mother, my family, are devoted, have been devoted, and had a history of caring for other people. Look at the black woman in the home. You know? I, I, so many of my white students at Emory tell me, um, I, we really don't know our parents. We know the nanny. Our parents were always gone. And it was black women who raised us. Now, one of the dilemmas is that black people, and I hope the black women in this gathering correct me, black women sometimes are slow to care for themselves because they've had such a history. Even those of you who didn't you know, work in white people's home, you know, even my wife. I, I think it's a culture thing. And sometimes I just say, darling, for, you gotta take care of yourself, baby. I can, I, I, I got that. I can take care of that, girl. I, you know, I've got to encourage her and say, darling, I got that. But, um, like I said earlier, I need help because I discovered my wife, my wife has become my mother. I say, darling, whatever Please, sisters, when you speak up, it, it, it's, it's something about, you know, even I sit down to, to, to have a, a discussion, a marital thing, and here is a black man and a black woman, and you can see the sister is suffering, you, you know, violence in the home, all that kind of stuff, you know, and, and I say, um, so, 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 why don't leave the Negro? You say what he's doing. She said, but the children, the children, I've got to, I've got to be there for the children. I said, so what the children need, what will happen to you? So, so the care, I, I think we're pro programmed, uh, maybe slavery up, up, you know, we're programmed to care for others, and we don't know how to care for ourselves. Diabetes is killing us, overweight is killing us, this, this, this is killing us, the other is killing us, and we know how to help others. We don't have a history of helping ourselves. And, and so that's where we really, really need help. And a lot of that, I figure, may be structural, back to what you're saying. A, a lot of it, you know, um, we take it for granted that we, grew, we were born into a world that was set up that way. You, you know, where we see ourselves as the servant class. You know, and we look to my colleague and people of her ilk as the teachers. You, you, you know, sometimes you walk into a room, you know, um, if you go to church, you walk into a room, if you go to black church, into a room, and the minute you walk in, the black folks say, oh, you're here, come take over the class. <laughs> yeah, we do that. Yeah. I, 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 they had me to interview for some church the other day, they called transitional church, and I went early. And most of the congregation is black, you know, because the white folks left. Yeah. But the few white folks who were there were all the Sunday school teachers. <laughs> so, so talk about, you know, what is set in place. What is set in place is we are trained to look to you for leadership. And sometimes we have to exclude you so that we can deal with ourselves. I, I, I'm a member for the Society for the Study of Black Religion that was formed in the 60s. And you know why it got started? Because whenever we had white folks in there, we deferred to the white person. And so to force us, 
to face one another and to deal with one another. We had to say to our white friends, we love you, but don't come to that meeting. <laughs> yeah, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said the same thing when he was in Harlem and went to other city of Baptist church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, I went to church to learn from black people. But the minute I walk into the Sunday school class, they say, oh, here's a white man, Bill, you, you come teach us. You got a lot to teach us. And we never did believe we had something to teach. So there's a lot of stuff we, we, we have to change. And we're grateful for partners like you who can help us claim that. Uh, my name is Calvin Bayes, um, student from White House School of Medicine. And uh, Dr. Erskine, when you were speaking earlier, you posed a question about reconciliation. And you made me think that you asked, are we ready to really have that conversation? And what I jotted down was, in order, in my mind, what I believe, in order for us to really confront this conversation around reconciliation, we have to look at this white supremacy and also white privilege. And as we look at all these other isms, we have to look at the sense of privilege that's a part of that conversation as well. And do you believe that society is really ready to give up these privileges to have this true conversation of reconciliation? Doctor, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's it right there. I mean, you, you know, part of, part of what, what we talk about 1619 to, to 2019, you know? And, and back in 1619, you watch the thing change. You know, where, as I said in my paper, black people and white people in the 1640s worked side by side as servants. And then after a while it was phased out and you had the term, um, black people became servants for life. Whereas white people were set free. And so the children of white people were born free and the, and the children of black people were born slaves. And that has continued, especially in America. It's gotten worse under Trump, yes. you know, because Trump makes it clear uh, we're dealing with these islands down there, Honduras, El Salvador, or whatever, you, you know, that he doesn't really care for colored people. You know, and it sort of takes us way back, talk about Tuskegee. You know, I was reading this autobiography by Rosa Parks. And Rosa Parks said there was a time in Tuskegee when black people rode on the top of the buses. Did you know that? To read Rosa Parks' biography. She said, what, what in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 1930s, 40s, black folks used to ride on the carriers on top of the bus. And so when they got to the I never understood why black folks were happy in the back of the bus. So when they came down off the top of the bus and started riding in the back of the bus, they started to, to sing hallelujah. Hey, praise God, we are riding on top of the bus no more. And listen, we're coming from a long way. You know, and that's why we really got to get together to deal with that. You know, it's been a long history, a torturous history, you know, and um, we need allies in the struggle, like my distinguished colleague. We really need allies in the struggle to help us over, over this hump. And, 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 and to, because there's a value gap. We, and we gotta begin with each other. We gotta value each other. Yes. We gotta begin there. We gotta value each other. Praise God. It's a black thing and it's beautiful and it's valuable. It's just as valuable as the white thing. Cause you know, we just think that the white thing is more valuable than the, that's the history of slavery. And, and, and the old folks at my age, when you get to my age, you got to fight against it. You, want, you grew up in the thing, and you know, and it's hard to bracket it. So, I, I think, thank you, brother, that, that whole question of white privilege. We've got to deal with that. Okay. Oh, hey. I'm Akil Gregory with Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, I actually wanted to speak to Dr. Gallagher's point, but I don't know if you're free to answer. Um, when it comes to talks of reconciliation and speaking of what concrete steps we can actually take moving forward, the most common, the most common concrete action that I hear was what Ms. Gallagher was saying with education. And 
I'm not particularly satisfied with that alone. I can say just from my own personal upbringing that I was brought up in the culture of Afrocentrism. My mom wouldn't have any other way. And even with that, after having the option to go to an XYZ college or to go to a HBC, I went to HBC. And with my friends who were also black, but decided to go to PWIZ, um, they said afterwards, after graduating, oh, I would, would have liked to go to HBC. But there was a certain amount of privilege based. I can't even say, I don't know how I would describe it. All I can say is privilege period because I was not in an upper class, but I, I didn't have to pay for college due to a scholarship. But I could have gone anywhere. But I still dealt with a lack of resources. I'm satisfied with the quality of my education, but I'm not satisfied with what I can actually do with it. And so when we speak of reconciliation and, what we, and when we speak of concrete steps actually toward leveling the playing field, what do you have to say with it after having a full career, having been able to apply this education? Because I don't feel like I can do enough with it right now. Uh, one of the, one of the things that in terms of how I see myself, and I have been a university professor for many years and been teaching in a white school, ain't no black school that offered me a job, to be honest to you, God give us a white school. Tuskegee never did offer me a job. Morehouse never did offer me a job. You know, so I had to tell the truth. You know? um, Grateful to Dr. Ward because he gave me a chance. <laughs> In fact, I was so excited I came here last night. I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be late. I mean, I showed up like four o'clock at the hotel. And I said, I spoke to Dr. Hyde. He said, "You here already?" I said, "Man, I don't want to miss this chance." You know. So, so, but, but the way practically how I see myself, I see my. So, for example, I teach in the School of Theology, and when I went to Emory. We had like six black students in, in black church studies in the theology school. Now we have 104. And talk about practicality. I see myself as standing in the doorway. I make sure I'm on all the committees. Sometimes they say, man, you're on another as a year. I mean, you know, because on this committee I can fight for some black students. And I can be there, you know, to share with them. So I would say one practical way to reconciliation is that to talk about power is that now that you got in that Morehouse and you're a doctor, stand in the doorway to make room for others to come in. And conduct yourself in such a way that you don't burn the bridge so others after you can't come in. You know, that's some kind of practical ways to, 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 to break it down. I think that's, that's a place to start. Okay, um, thank you. I, I think it's a really good point. And I know when I speak, sometimes I sound a bit idealistic. Do you know Pollyanna? Pollyanna? You know? So, but I do believe in education. You're absolutely right, it's not enough. And maybe to come back to the learning I've had from Dr. Warren, uh, I'll talk about myself. So I'm the eldest of four children from a rural community, a lot like Tuskegee, as your rural west of Ireland community. I was the first person in my family to get a degree. And how did I get there? And then, um, because I had a few people who believed in me. I came to England for Mrs. Thatcher, and she didn't have a great reputation. <laughs> but when she was uh, in power, you could have a free education. So I got her to do a university course for free. And I'm so grateful. So I think policy, politics, I think you have to have opportunities for people. Um, so, and I think absolutely, I think class is really critical as well. We are we are disadvantaged, of course, if we come from working class, if it, rather than many because our parents, don't, my parents didn't even know what higher education was. Uh, they didn't know it was possible. But I know better, and I know a 23-year-old daughter, and I'm backing her to the hilt. Everything she says, and it's fantastic. Go, Gerd. Um, so, so we can do a lot as role models, and absolutely, people like you, people like me. I'm going back to my school actually. I'm really excited in September. 
to speak to young people in my rural schools, I went to a conference school, so that is other issues, <laughs> what did I say? But um, I'm going to go back and speak to those young people because everything is possible and if you believe that absolutely you do have to have you know, self-confidence and self-respect and, and also self-care and completely uh, in agreement. So I agree, just saying education sounds a little bit too idealistic, we need all the other things around that. And we need uh, carrots and sticks, we do need laws as well, we need uh, anti-discriminatory laws that people will be punished if they don't do the right thing, because not everyone, like people here, are inclined to do the right thing. But uh, So I think we need a very mixed approach, and, and thank you very much, it's a really great question. We, we have, we're really out of time, but if we could take one more question. try to get a piece of land, I guarantee you it might take me a year. Because you can never become somebody owning a car that can always build wealth owning a piece of land. That's right. And you're right, sister, um, the land is a symbol of shame. The land shames us. The blood of our Indian and African ancestors cry out from the land because we have despoiled and defamed the land. And you're right, thank you for reminding us of those ancestors who were torn away, literally torn away from the land and marched out of town. And I hope we can let that be a part of our story. Thank you so much. And I would just do the same. I benefited hugely from our conversation, and I think it's truly wonderful as we have a Native American perspective at this conference. It's mm -hmm. really critical. And your work is so critical. Thank you, everybody. That's, you, you know, um, we, we really appreciate that perspective because that just shows us how deeply complex uh, people who protest. Um, trying to find liberation, how complex the issues really are. There's always these background stories and information. That is not always in, in, in epistemology, that is the nature of knowledge, it's not always what you know, is that there's a whole lot that we don't know that compromise what we do know. So there's so much work to be done just to have the conversation. We want to thank Dr. I'm, I'm uniquely tied to both of our panelists, Dr. Um, Gallagher, she, my first day at Tuskegee, she was here at, as a Fulbright Scholar, and uh, she invited me to join her in an article, um, a commentary article on gun violence. So meeting this very unique Irish lady invited me to talk about gun violence in America it was, I do do an ethics perspective, it was very, very interesting, but we got it done, so I really appreciate that. And I have the uniqueness with Dr. Erskine as, as uh, the, the voice that my 
mentor who I told you passed away, he called Noah Erskine and said, there's a young man that we need to get to Emory. And, th and that's where our conversation began. And interestingly, he has the uniqueness of having signed my master's degree, my first doctorate degree, and he was on my dissertation committee for my PhD. So he has signed every document. So if I ever say anything foolish, <laughs> look to him. <laughs> His signature is on all the works that I've done. So we pretty tremendously appreciate these two have for presented. Let's have a hand clap for them. Because of the Let us recognize also Miss Sydney Head. Thank you very much, Miss Head, for giving us a wonderful and now we bring to you Dr. Ruben Warren, our visionary, our seer, so that he can he can uh, recognize Dr. Gallagher and Dr. We continue with our, I think, very exciting activities. One, one um, acknowledgement that I think we 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 tried to do, we don't know we're doing, is the the, the um, recognize not only injustice but justice and when we try to carry it out. Our visit to uh, the Tuskegee History Museum, if you were thoughtful and very careful in walking through there, um, Attorney Gray was intentional about tracing the beginnings of Macon County and every ethnic racial group has come through there. So where we stand is on whose shoulders we stand. And so I think that was our intent and we continue to do that as we go through. We're real clear about um, the land, who it belongs to, who has it, and who's losing it. So that struggle is going on as we speak. So it, it's, uh, I, I clearly have a bias about this place called Tuskegee, um, not because I am from here, but because I am here. Really, really important. We're, we're very intentional and very specific on who we invite. I can't stop anybody from coming to Macon County, Tuskegee, or to the university. That's up to them. But I can be thoughtful about who I invite. Uh, and I am very thoughtful. Who I invite and who I don't invite. I'm thoughtful to both. And we, what you'll see is the same folk are invited all the time. Because they always have something to say that we need to hear. And equally as important, they have questions that you need to ask them that you didn't have a chance to ask them. So you'll see the same faces here year after year. We also want to be clear, when you come here, we want folk to know uh, how proud we are to have you here. And we try to give you samples of Tuskegee as you carry on your way. And our keynote, we always give them something special. And Dr. Erskine, we have something special for you. If you'll join me, I'll share that with you. The, the folks who have been here know that we have a, a, a pen set that has Tuskegee University on there for Dr. Kirsten. I mean, want to uh, give this to him and thank him for continuing to contribute to our university <coughs> as your pen set. And uh, somebody that's been here, tell, me, tell, tell this story, so I want to tell it again. This is a, this is a coin uh, that was uh, developed, coined, uh, created by a Tuskegee alum who lives here and at our 100 year uh, celebration of Booker T. Washington's life and his creation of Negro Health Week, he created these coins and he will only give them to folk who come here. And uh, so you come here and we're giving you this coin. Somebody tell the story. <coughs> so I want to say it again. If you see someone else who has that coin, it means that they stole it. <laughs> <laughs> and from my colleague, Dr. Gallagher, she, she came last year as a Fulbright scholar, and she will be here forever as a bioethics, bioethics visiting scholar. So she, she's here and there everywhere, but always comes back to Tuskegee. So I, when she said she was coming, I didn't worry about how she's going to get here, how she's going to none of that. She knows more about this place than I do. So I want to again thank you for your contribution. And here's a, here's a coin. Okay. <laughs> 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at our final talk for talks for today. So let us take uh, two minutes just to reset ourselves, reset the desk, and then I'll come back and introduce our person. Thank you. Thank you.